Hi there. Thanks for joining us on Let's Talk Taste with Sherry, where we're saving the earth one flavor at a time by gathering community to share wisdom around the natural connections between our innate sense of taste and flavors that are grown in healthy, regenerative soils. Welcome. Hey there, Sherry Hess with The Flavor Remedy. Thanks for joining me for another episode of Let's Talk Taste with Sherry, saving the earth one flavor at a time. All right, so today I want you guys to really answer a question for me. This is something that I'm really invested in researching and you'll probably hear me ask it a lot of different ways over time because it's the crux of everything that I'm creating here. And that question is, do you trust your taste buds as a guide for nutrition? I know it sounds crazy, right? I've asked this question a couple times already and I've gotten some really off, like completely opposing answers around this question. So if you don't go any further than this in this video, if you do nothing else, just go to the bottom and comment or send me an email or post it on Facebook or anywhere, Instagram. Let me know your thoughts around this because this is the thing. This is the magic that I believe that this, this message that I'm putting out there can do. Can you imagine if you can actually trust your sense of taste, your own body's wisdom, this tool that you're born with, if you could trust that to draw you to, to cause you to lean into, to divert your cravings, to actually be craving something that you no supports your body. This is the goal here. This is the end game. So we have to start with an awareness of why don't we trust our sense of taste to begin with? Like what is going on that this one particular sense has been so manipulated and so kind of obscured that we don't trust it. We don't even look at it as a reverent tool for our bodies, right? So I have some theories around this and, um, I would love your feedback on it as well. What your thoughts are, you know, I can think about this, but I've been thinking about like the background of this for years and years and years, right? Like I have so much that I think contributes to this, but I don't know what everyone else is thinking. And that matters. It matters what the world is thinking around this, not just what I have kind of, you know, the pieces of the puzzle that I've put together. But I will share with you the pieces of the puzzle that I've put together here. And this is what I think. So first of all, we think of our sense of taste as this superficial thing, that all that matters is the experience in our mouth. And after that, we forget about it. We forget about the flavor, right? We're not tuning in to Oh, I'm eating this apple and I'm, I'm really enjoying the flavor and the sweet. And, and maybe you're even thinking about the sour. Typically you're just thinking, Ooh, apple, sweet, chomp, swallow, be done. Right. But if we can even just take the steps to engage even a little bit further to look for the other flavors in the apple, look for the sour, look for the bitter in the skin, and then follow that up with how do I feel? How do I feel when I eat this thing? How do I feel 10 minutes later, an hour later, two hours later, the next day, right? This connection with flavor has to go beyond our taste buds. And this is one of the reasons why we can't trust our taste buds, because we're not giving it reverence beyond the experience on our senses, our sense of taste alone. We're not following it up with checking in. How's that working for me? Right? This, this is, this is step one. Um, The other thing that we need to become really aware of is that we're being marketed. We're being really fed so much information and not just from the diet culture, but from advertising, processed food. And we're also making choices. We're making choices that are muting our sense of taste, that are not not actually exposing ourselves to the diversified flavors that we should be experiencing. So like a perfect example of this is, you know, I'm of an age where I have seen a a, a very interesting transition in my life. So I grew up on with a nice piece of land in New Jersey in the garden state. My dad was a farmer. So we've always gardened, right? I've always had a garden. It's been one of my favorite things to do every year of my life. And as a kid, I didn't have that much of an appreciation for it. Actually, as a kid, it was just something that we did. 
But as a result, we always had, you know, fresh green beans and we would stew tomatoes and we would jar tomatoes and like so much so that, you know, as a kid, you get sick of it, like seriously, another jar of steamed, like stewed tomatoes, Uh, right? Like no appreciation for what you have when you have it, right? But then, you know, as, as we grow up and kind of went through the age of TV dinners starting to be a thing, right? Like this was cool. I can sit and I can watch the Wizard of Oz while I'm eating Salisbury steak in the TV room. Like this was awesome, right? Like not only did I not have to sit at the table with my family, but I was eating this food that was like flavorful and just cool because I could watch TV while I was doing it. And it's so fascinating to think back because do I remember the flavor of it? Maybe kind of. And at the time, you know, when, when these packaged foods started happening, I have no idea what level of um, flavor additives they were. Like it could have really been a good piece of meat with real gravy, you know, (laughs) but it has changed so much since then. Everything has changed so much in the food world, right? Even, even at that point, but the flavor, we just took the flavor for granted. We did exactly what I just talked about. We experienced it on our taste buds. We were like, whoop, whoop, this is really cool. And we ate it and we didn't think about it anymore, right? And the other thing that was kind of happening at the same time is like, I remember like Fruity Pebbles, right? And the Flintstone cereals and the Count Jocula cereals and all of the marketing talking to us about, okay, kids who have breakfast do better in school. And instead of forcing your kids to eat vitamins, we're now spraying vitamins all over the sugar and it's going to be really good for your kids. So like, we're like, okay, well, you know, there's vitamins in this cereal. My kid's getting breakfast. He's going to do really good in school, but no one's paying attention to the fact that you're feeding the kids cereal. They're going to school. They're like eating bread dye number 40 and probably bouncing off the walls at school. Can't focus, can't do anything, but you know, we're told it's good for us. (laughs) So marketing in food is a long time thing. Like this is a long time journey of what we're being told and what we're being fed and also taking advantage of humans leaning into sweet and humans leaning into salty. Salisbury steak is salty. Fruity pebbles is sweet, right? So there's this, there's this knowing in the, in the food science world and in the marketing world of food of what humans choose and why they choose it. So then all we have to do is paint the picture that it's good for you and we're in, we're in like Flynn. Plus it's simple and it adds to our chaotic life that we've decided we want to have too, right? So marketing is a big step in why we don't trust our taste buds anymore. In addition to marketing, it's the, this manufactured flavor. It's this processing of sugar. It's this elimination of bitters from natural sweeteners of things. And when I say natural, I don't mean natural flavoring. I mean, real life living flavors. Um, The more we bleach and process the sugar, the less antioxidants and polyphenols and good things we're getting. Very convenient for manufactured food, but we're not getting the whole picture of of what flavor is supposed to be in nature that way, right? So these manufactured flavors, this recreation of aroma, which is what most artificial and natural flavors are, is this recreation of aroma, not flavor. And we don't care. We're not caring about it. We're not giving reverence to it. We're just saying, oh, tasted good enough to get down. I'm good. It's it's just like the chocolate steak syndrome that I talk about, right? It's like no one's going to eat pea protein, like three tablespoons of pea protein would taste really gross. So we're going to make it taste like chocolate. So you get it down and you're like, sweet, I just drank something that's really good for me. And it tasted like chocolate. And that's all I all I care about. Like we just keep feeding this monster by not giving it the reverence, right? So why can't we trust our tense of taste? These are two really big reasons why we are where we are. And um, so how can we do better? right? How can we do better? How can we trust our sense of taste? And I believe that the first thing we need to do is actually engage our brain and look at labels and make choices around flavor coming from nature versus flavor coming from a factory. Um, you know, we've, we've become so complacent 
in allowing flavors to be manipulated, allowing our taste buds to be manipulated because we don't think that it has importance. And here's the truth is if you give it importance and you give it the good stuff, and this is feedback I've gotten on this question, the opposite extreme of people that are like, are you crazy? I can't trust my sense of taste to the other side of people that are like, oh, I absolutely trust my cravings and my sense of taste because I've been down the road and I know, and I'm making choices based upon what I know is good for my body. And those are the people that are choosing living flavors and real food. And it's a thing. It's a real thing. So I invite you become more curious, engage your sense of taste beyond the actual taste buds, feel your body afterwards. What do you feel like? But start with reading labels, start with recognizing where the flavor is coming from.